Woody Womack joined by Mike Farrell in a very special video edition of the Three Point Stance. Mike's been so anxious to do this. He's been beating the <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's been a dream of mine, you know. I mean, it's finally come true. So here we are, Mike. So let's jump right into the topics. Number one, big recent commits. This is something you like to do. Let's start with uh, Latrell Neville to Virginia Tech, Texas wide receiver, a guy whose stock was sky high probably a year ago, year plus. He ends up at Virginia Tech. What's your take? You know, if you remember correctly on the rankings meetings a year, year and a half ago, I said he's – He's one of the higher publicized kids in the nation, but I just didn't see, you know, a lot of people had him, I think, in the top 30 or 40 in the country early, and I didn't see that. Uh, four star is good. I think he's a high three, but, you know, getting a kid from Texas, uh, they got Demetrius Davis at quarterback. Now they got Novell at, uh, you know, out of Texas. It's certainly going to allow Justin Fuente to spot recruit there. Um, you know, he didn't put up big numbers last year, but it was a run-oriented offense overall. Um, he does have skill. There's no doubt about it. And Virginia Tech definitely will take kids like this for sure. But they've got to make their bread and butter in the southeast, and they've got to also recruit the home state a little bit better before they start going off into Texas. What, what's crazy is, uh, you know, it's easy to forget that Fuente had those big Texas roots, and when he was at Memphis – he really built the roster through Texas, and we haven't seen him do it at Virginia Tech. So I know you – obviously the local talent is key, but it seems like those relationships are finally starting to pay off for him with the Hokies. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. I mean, these are two players that are four-star prospects, and obviously Davis is a coach's son, and, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of influence there. So I think Texas is definitely going to be a place where they're going to be able to pull kids. They're not a big threat to Texas, Texas A&M or Oklahoma for some of the big players in there or LSU. But, uh, you know, it's a nice place to recruit. It's very, there's a lot of depth there. I, I just wish that Virginia Tech recruited a little bit better in their home state. I mean, Travian Henderson is an example of a kid getting out of state going to, you know, Ohio State. Reggie Grimes is probably not going to stay in state. So, you know, they're working backwards a little bit. And Tony I don't want to. Grimes. Tony Grimes. Tony right. Grimes. Who's Reggie Grimes? Oh, that's right. He was the Oklahoma linebacker. Tony's a lot that's, better than Reggie. I think. That's, <laughs> that's my head. It's just, there's so many names in it. Um, so, you know, I, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, poo poo on this. This is good. Um, you know, it's just, it's an interesting uh, reach for Virginia Tech to get into Texas. All right. So, uh, Real quick, let me speak on Neville, because I was the Texas analyst, actually, at one point at this company. Uh, I honestly thought after his sophomore season that if he did that, if he had a good, like, four or five-month stretch, he was going to be a five-star. And I have not seen him since that time at anything. It's crazy. You know, the, the evaluation evolves. And sometimes these guys, like you said, he was highly publicized early and maybe he's fallen behind some of the other guys that we thought he was ahead of. So uh, I just wanted to put that out there. Uh, last week, system. they do but, run a lot, you know. Oh, right. But I mean, that's not keeping him from coming to seven on seven and camps yeah. and stuff like that, where a lot of times we've seen guys who, who, who don't put up big numbers show us their skills. And that, like, like Nicole Hardman was playing quarterback, you know? Uh, yeah. Now, his, his, his progression is, is plateaued a bit, so he's going to have to step it up a little bit more. All right, moving on. Uh, three-point stances. We just rip people apart here. That's right. Uh, move, moving on, Lewis Hansen oh. to Michigan, uh, a commit that he did exclusively with me and my uh, quarantine beard here. Uh, that was a huge addition for the Wolverines. Where do you think he stacks up? Because we actually have a, a very tight race for that number one uh, tight end position. You know, he, he, he's not the athlete that Zach, Zach Gentry was, you know, like a quarterback that turned into a tight end. Um, but he's going to be that type of player at Michigan. Uh, he's certainly not, to me, the number one tight end in the country, um, you know, athletically. Uh, but Michigan's very interesting. They're, they're recruiting a lot of New England kids. And that's because of Don Brown and his ties to New England. And, you know, not just defensive players, but offensive players as well. And they recruit New Jersey extremely well. Now, I don't know if they can take the next step focusing on those areas. They want to get more kids from the Southeast, uh, like Ohio State does. And they're well behind Ohio State in recruiting. But Hanson's the type of kid that fits their offense well because he can be a good inline blocker. 
Uh, he can stretch the field a little bit. He could be a red zone guy. Uh, I don't see number one tight end or anything like that, but I do see a good pickup here. And it's hard to tell with these New England kids. I mean, sometimes they, they, they are playing such horrible competition. I remember Zach Rogers, uh, who went to Cal, who's in the NFL now. Is it Zach Rogers? No, Justin Rogers. I don't even remember. Um, but, you know, I saw him play against the worst competition you're ever going to see, and he didn't care. He just was, like, lazy, and I'm like, this kid doesn't want it, and now he's in the NFL. So, um, you know, Hanson might not be tested yet, and I think, you know, when he gets to the Big Ten, he's going to be a very good player. Well, you know, Gronk and Aaron Hernandez, both uh, from up there in the in – the- your backyard, right? Bristol was Aaron Hernandez, and then Gronk was uh, New York, and then he moved down to Pennsylvania. Woodland Hills, where they used him as a blocker. Very smart, Woodland Hills. Good job. Uh, well, well, we'll talk about that another time. Uh, <laughs> moving on, Tennessee, uh, they pick up a commitment from Jalen Wright about a week and a half ago, and then uh, Walker Merrill. Interesting, a couple interesting guys. Wright kind of off the radar uh, completely. And Merrill, a guy that that stock seemed to be on the rise. What was your take on those two? You know, one has tremendous speed, but isn't a great football player, and that's right. You know, he's a he's a sprinter. He's very very sudden, uh, but he doesn't have the natural instincts. You know, of a of a great guy. You know, running back. He's not a natural. Uh, you know, guy who finds the hole, his vision is a little bit off sometimes, and, and sometimes he'll try to bounce things outside and use his speed too much. But a high three-star kid, and, and that speed you can't teach. You know, and then there's Merrill, who's a, a very good route runner, a guy who sets people up, a student of the game, uh, good hands, steady as they come, but just doesn't run that well. So, you know, if you could put right speed into Merrill, you'd have a five-star player. But you know, both of them have their limitations, but I think they're both good additions, um, you know, and, and I think Merrill's going to be the type of kid that's going to really impact Tennessee. They're going to love him there because he's just going to be a quarterback's best friend. He's going to gain separation, consistently move the chains and be that type of guy. Yeah, you know, I've actually seen Merrill in all types of settings over three or four years now. There's been some conflicting talk about his speed. Some say he can crack 10-7 in the 100 meters personally watching him play in a game I didn't see it uh, but he's one that we're going to watch especially into the fall I think he could be a little higher especially at the position than he is now so uh, and right like you said I mean could he be you know uh, I don't want to pull a, a Sam Spiegelman here but could he be like a DeAnthony Thomas where he isn't just a pure running back maybe he's used in the slot or maybe he's used on those jet sweeps and stuff like that because of that speed well, if you're going to pull a Spiegelman, let's compare him to Percy Harvin. <laughs> Might as well compare him to one of the all-time greatest high school football players I've ever seen because that's, that's the Sam go-to right there. But, you know, I mean, I think they're both good football players. I think Merrill has a chance to be a four-star kid. I'm not sure if Wright does, you know. But, again, the speed on the track doesn't always translate to the field, and, and, and that's okay. Um, you know, Merrill's fast enough. Uh, Wright is super fast, but, you know, I think there's re- some refinement that needs to take place as a football player for him to be ranked higher. Okay, a couple other real quick. Uh, USC picked up a couple. Uh, Zamarian Gordon, I think it's how you say it, and Brandon Campbell. Yeah. Uh, tell me about the Trojans. We've well, seen- We've seen Ryan Young hinting that they're on about to go on a roll here on the recruiting trail, too. Yeah, and the point I wanted to make about these two commitments are these are good commitments. Last year was such a disaster for Clay Helton. Um, you know, just so bad. The recruiting class was horrendous uh, by USC standards. They were not involved with all the West Coast five stars and all this such. Um, you know, even the year before, they ended up getting a couple five stars out of transfer rather than actually getting them to commit. And I think things are going better now. You know, these are two solid recruits. Now, these aren't five-star kids. We're not talking to Dory Jackson. We're not talking Emon Marshall. We're not talking, you know, uh, the elite of the elite at, at wide receiver, the, the, the Juju Smiths of the world. But the, the quality is improving. And, and more kids are interested in USC and talking about USC. And every time I think about USC, I think about Slovis coming back and the talent they have at wide receiver and JT Daniels coming back healthy and pushing Slovis and the talent they have on the defensive side of the ball in certain spots. 
I think they could have a really good year on the field. It depends on how well he coaches. And then if they do, then they'll be back to recruiting regularly. But these two commitments I wanted to point out because these are pretty good gets, you know, for USC especially. I think both kids are fast, you know, and they need to increase the speed, uh, especially on the defensive side of the ball at USC. Yeah, and this is the Dante Williams effect, right? At the- oh, yes. You, you could take one coach and put him in a program, and he could change that program uh, if he's a Dante Williams type of recruiter. Um, it's just amazing to see some of these guys. And we've seen it over the years with different guys who have been recruiters of the year. Tommy Thigpen, what he did at Tennessee. Larry Johnson, what he did at, at Penn State, what he's doing at Ohio State. Ed Orgeron, when he was an assistant coach. Some guys are just magnets for tremendous recruits and and that was a huge hire it's going to change the balance of power recruiting wise in the in the Pac-12. Uh, last but not least Camaro Edmonds uh, to North Carolina. North Carolina is, is doing a very good job but at the same time they've had a couple of really highly ranked guys kind of slip away so what what do you think about the Tar Heels and how Edmonds fits in? That's going to happen. I mean, they still haven't proven anything on the field. Sam Howell had a great year. They didn't have a great season overall. You know, Mac Brown's rebuilding what was a horrible roster. There's a ton of young talent on that team. Spring ball, you know, missing spring ball hurts everybody. It's going to hurt North Carolina for sure. But now they're starting to lure more and more talent um, because Mac Brown is an elite recruiter and he's got a tremendous staff. So, you know, is this Evan Pryor? I think Evan Pryor is a better running back, um, you know, than, than Kamaro Edmonds, but he's not a bad player at all. Um, he can do a lot of different things as well for you if he doesn't pan out at running back because he can play wide receiver, he can play defense, do a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of versatility there. Um, you know, am I worried that they're going to lose some in-state guys? Yeah, and they are. Um, Clemson's hard to beat in North Carolina. Ohio State's coming in there. Alabama's coming in there. Everybody is. But North Carolina is no longer the place where you can just pick and choose the in-state kids and steal them away. Uh, I think that is now New Jersey. Uh, And to some extent, I think that's the case in, in California, believe it or not, but not North Carolina anymore. All right. Next up, uh, I don't know what we would call the second category. I wanted to say second down, but Maybe just second point. Uh, <laughs> a two-point stance so I can get out of the three-point stance because it well, hurts. We go to two. I mean, I, yeah, I don't know how many times you put your hand in the dirt, Mike, but uh, – Every day. I'd like to get you in a three-point stance and see if you can hold your balance. I could. I could. I, people don't believe it, but I definitely could. But these are guys that I, I looked at and I said, eh, a lot of people don't really know where they're going to go, so why don't I take a shot at it? Yeah, so these are predictions. So I yeah, like predictions. these are predictions. Some of these are obvious. Some of them are stupid, and some of them are on point. But we might as well do it. It's what we do. So okay. we got to start up. with the wolf. Yeah, the I wolf. I told the wolf the other day, by the way, he needs to stick with the wolf nickname. Uh-huh. <laughs> kind of shied away from it. So we're talking about Terrence Lewis. Well, let's explain, let's explain the wolf real quick. Terrence Lewis, elite linebacker from South Florida on the fringe of five-star status, called himself the wolf because he said everybody wants to be the goat until the wolf shows up. So uh, (laughs) it is, it's really good. He he needs to stick with it. Uh, Anyway. uh, So he put out a top five or top six or top seven or six. uh, That's a whole different topic. I get so mad when kids add a sixth one in there Uh, because you know, that's the school they're not going to. If they tell you five and then they say, Hey, I need to add in X. Yeah. You're not going there. You don't got to add them in. Um, but anyway. Eh, makes for a better graphic. All right. Let's, let's hear your prediction. Uh, several schools involved. We don't have to list them all, but tell us who you think is in the league. Well, he's not going in state. You know, he's already right. said that. And I don't know if whether that's by choice or by the schools backing off him. And I, I've talked to a couple schools uh, in state that said they're still recruiting him heavily. But who knows? You know, he obviously had to uh, switch high schools and – all that, but he's going to head out of state. And I think Texas A&M is, is where it's going to be. You know, um, our, our, our guy Donnell is there and, you know, he's working on him. And, and Jimbo recruits the state of Florida extremely well. He's got ties there. Um, when you look at some of the other schools, Tennessee would make sense. Penn State, probably not. Um, you know, Alabama, I'm not sure if they're, you know, really that high on him. Nebraska, probably not going to happen too far away. So when you look at some of the schools he's mentioned, 
I think Texas A&M is going to be that one, and, and they're going to continue to do well in the state of Florida. Yeah, I would put Tennessee uh, as the second, like if we're ranking the contenders. Uh, Rob wrote that article. I, I didn't read it, but I would put Tennessee second. Uh, <laughs> you didn't read it? Well, I'm reading a lot of articles these days with my job, and uh, I'm getting real mad at some of them, but that, that is not one I – I don't read them because they're on the graphic. I don't need to see who's uh, – Well, get, yeah, and I don't know if Terrence knows where he's going. He says he knows. He told me he knows where he's going. He's, he's done and he knows, but I don't know. If he knows. Tell him to get on here and do a commitment with us. What's the holdup? <sighs> he's a different cat, man. He's the wolf. All right. He's a different guy. He's a wolf. Uh, <laughs> if you listen to my podcast, you will learn that uh, I had a pet wolf as a child as we were talking about the Tiger King. So uh, check that. That I did not know. Uh, anyway, number two, five-star offensive lineman Bryce Foster. Now, this one I really like because he said he's not announcing, I think, until December. Rumors are Texas A&M. Then he visited Oklahoma before everything went crazy. Uh, a lot of people want him. I think I'm forgetting who else, Oregon and some others. Yep. Uh, you are picking Oklahoma. Why? I even future cast at Oklahoma. Oh, boy. Big time. Yes. Stand back. That visit, I think, changed everything. Um, you know, Oklahoma does a tremendous job of producing and developing offensive linemen. They've done a great job recent years. They have one of the best offensive line coaches in Bill Biedma that you're going to find. And I really think that that visit changed his, his thought process. Um, A&M was the leader heading into that visit, and now it's Oklahoma. Now, again, who knows when we're going to get visits, when kids are going to get back out there. Uh, if you wait till December, things could change. But right now, Oklahoma is the team to beat without a doubt. And that would be huge for them because they, they have done a great job developing offensive linemen. But a lot of the guys they've taken over the years have been – almost like projects or guys that not necessarily everybody saw, uh, you know, the, the potential in. Orlando Brown uh, was, a, was a guy that we thought, I mean, we ranked him as a 5'7", so we thought if everything went right, maybe he turns out. They turned him into an NFL player. And then I'm, I'm, the name of the center is escaping me, um, who's really good for them right now. Do you remember his yeah. name? Yeah. Well, I mean, you look at – they've had Outland guys – over the last few years and, and they've had, you know, PFF's best offensive line grades over the last few years as well. So it's one of those things where they consistently develop offensive linemen and, and kids are noticing Aaron Parks last year went from Maryland to Oklahoma because of that reason. So they're starting to recruit nationally. Now this is a Texas kid right in their, you know, wheelhouse, but Oklahoma's known for producing offensive linemen lately. And, um, you know, I, I think, you know, Texas A&M has done a better job putting linemen into the pros, but it doesn't matter. The, the opportunity to go to the playoff as well is important here, too. So I think Foster just likes what he sees there, has a good relationship with the OL coach, and, and that's where he's going to head. Uh, Creed Humphrey was who I was thinking of. Yes, Creed Humphrey is – he was a three-star, I believe, and obviously we, we know about Orlando and, you know, his – But, but even like Adrian Ely, who I'm looking at here, is supposed to be their starting right tackle. He was a guy that in high school was like, oh, LSU doesn't want him. That's uh, Louisiana, Texas, yeah. Right, yeah. Texas doesn't want him. Oh, he's not a take. And you're looking at a guy who's 6'7", you know, a tall guy who's athletic, but he needed some work. But they do the great yeah. job of bringing him in, redshirting them. So, but I'm just saying this has now lifted them to another level. That player development now has them in the mix for guys who may not need Yes, because those guys weren't that good. Right, exactly. But Bryce Foster is good. The Mountain. <laughs> The mountain is good. You know, he's not a project. He's a plug and play right away type of guy. So you develop linemen, you put them in the league, then you start getting the five stars. All right. Uh, next up, uh, Emeka Egbuka, uh, the talented wide receiver out of Washington, who, by the way, we're really getting robbed of seeing highlights of him because he looked like he was on his way to having one of these uh, DeMond Demas esque springs where he just tears up every event. Yeah. So what do you think? Yeah, well, where do you think he ends up? Well, it's funny, too, because now with, with the lack of travel, everybody thinks that, you know, the local schools have the advantage. Um, and I think to an extent that's true, but I still see this kid going to Ohio State, you know. And I've talked to him about, you know, why does everybody think you're going to Ohio State? And they're like, well, you know, I visited there. I have a real good relationship with the coaches. And, you know, G. Scott went there. So people just assume I'm going to follow. He's got a top seven. He wanted to visit all of them. 
Not sure if he's going to be able to do that. So this goes against the grain a little bit. I think Washington probably has an advantage right now with, with everybody not traveling. But I think this kid's going to wait it out, and Ohio State's going to be where he goes, and he's going to be just a superstar there, just like Garrett Wilson will be. And, you know, obviously the mm -hmm. wide receivers they got last year, Julian Fleming. And, oh, yeah, Fleming, Mookie Cooper. I, I mean, it's just ridiculous what Ryan Day is doing there. So you can't bet against him um, for this kid, even though he's from the state of Washington. Um. Yeah, I, I wonder how much the coaching change – because now Washington's got a defensive-minded coach, and I just sort of wonder, does that impact it, whereas Ryan Day can sell, hey, I'm going to start really getting the ball to the receivers. Although, I, I kind of like – when we talked about this off the air, I don't know, we were together. I want to see the production. And I know Justin Fields does a lot of everything where, you know, he's going to run some – but I want to. I want them to see. I want to see guys put up huge numbers like LSU because, at the same time, like they've had a lot of high ranked receivers. They they haven't necessarily produced uh, the huge numbers like we thought. They will. You know. I mean. Again, you look at quarterbacks. Kids care about quarterbacks. You know. Dwayne Haskins was a first rounder. Justin Fields is going to be a first rounder. That's what kids care about. And Washington has not produced a quarterback in a long time. You know. Luke Falk was good. Uh, he was at Washington State. Come on. I mean, not Luke Falk. Who's the one I'm thinking of then? Uh, you're thinking of the short guy from California who had all the, the – Yeah, he threw like 85 touchdowns. And that was definitely Jake. <laughs> all their quarterbacks are – Jake Browning. Jake Browning. Jake, Jake Browning. Um, Siler Miles never panned out there. Siler uh, Miles. What Jake, a <laughs> Jake, listen, Siler Miles was awesome. Jacob Eason obviously was up and down there. So the quarterback, you know, just hasn't been – it, it's not as sexy to sell as it is at Ohio State. And Ohio State can even say, listen, we had Joe Burrow and we had to let him go. But yeah. I, I think they will produce numbers for sure. And, well, and Egbuka will be part of that. Right. And part of it is they do a good job sp spreading the ball around too. So I shouldn't – I'm not I'm not saying, you know, Ohio State's offense is, it hasn't been productive. I'm just saying there hasn't been one guy, in my opinion, that, that really jumps out. But obviously the receivers don't care, and, and we'll see how that is going forward. Uh, next up, Tony Grimes. Uh, you, we mentioned him earlier. Uh, you called him Reggie Grimes. I did. <laughs> You're like uh, – <laughs> there's a lot of names floating around in your head. We're up against – Well, you know what doesn't happen when I write articles? Uh, you can fix it and do research? Yeah, my, uh, my, my clear dementia doesn't step in and – show on video like it is right now so uh <laughs> writing articles is much better but tony grimes the five-star cornerback out of virginia i got going to georgia i think penn state is a real threat here obviously he's going to carry this for a long time i think he's going to take visits there's going to be many twists and turns but he loved that georgia visit so much and this is just another example of an sec school you know they got kaylee ringo from the west coast they get tony grimes from you know, Virginia, Georgia just can recruit nationally, and the SEC is such a lure that that's where I think he's going to go. Now, he is not going to make a decision anytime soon. Uh, yeah, and I, I think that he's going to be one that I could see being impacted the longer we have this prolonged uh, dead period, but I don't know. I think I wouldn't rule out those schools from up there. In the North. I wouldn't rule out Penn State. Yeah, I mean, I covered his uh, – <laughs> I covered his, his brother in high school, and I know his dad, and I know he's not going to be one of those kids that commits and flips and flips and flips and flips. They're going to take their time. They're going to do their homework. They're going to, they're going to play it smart. But I just think Georgia has impressed him the most right now, and, uh, you know, might as well. I haven't future casted it yet, though, so I, I'm not that solid on it. He's very active on TikTok, too. Uh, I don't know if you've seen. So am I. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dancing. All right, next up. Tristan Lee, a guy that uh, was ranked as a three-star, if you could believe that, just uh, just <laughs> nine months ago until uh, until I laid eyes on him and oh, corrected the evaluation appropriately. Here we go. Here we go. Um, UVA now, legacy. Uh, yeah, he's a he's a Virginia legacy, which is which is interesting, but the big dogs are coming calling. Uh, yeah. So he's got. He's going to he's going to Clemson or he's going to Penn State. He's not going to go to Virginia. They'll be in there. But Clemson really, I think, has a very strong lead right now, um, you know, for him. I think Ohio State would love to grab him and, and continue to build that offensive line class for this year. Um, but, you know, Clemson's hard to beat. I mean, when they want a kid, 
uh, you notice how Clemson is not throwing out early offers anymore now. They've become, <clears throat> you know, that school in the nation where it's the most coveted offer you can get, and they're the pickiest school in the country. And that's the level they're recruiting at now. So when they really hone in and target someone like they're doing with this kid, they're going to get them. Yeah, they've got a they've got a great system, and we can we can talk about that another time when we have more in depth. But uh, Lee. Who does Lee remind you of? Because I've kind of like gone back and forth. He weighs more than Mitch Hyatt did at this stage. And obviously we've seen Hyatt had a great college career. He's kind of shuffled around the NFL so far. But he's one of those guys that's going to have to add some weight to his frame, right? And probably his best days are ahead of him, but he's very fundamentally sound. Do you have a comp off the top of your head? Or? You know, he's more physical than those guys. He, he is, I guess, similar to a Walker Parks, but more athletic. Um, not as athletic as a Cyrus Quandro, but those guys who are like 285, who have that long frame, long arms, good technique, but are aggressive, uh, are hard to find. You know, so some of the guys I've mentioned, you know, Walker Parks is a little bit more physical than he is. Uh, Cyrus Quandro was not physical, but was a freak athlete. Um, you know, you mentioned Mitch Hyatt, who wasn't an overly physical kid, but was very athletic with good feet. So I think this is what colleges and NFL are looking for, are those guys that you can build up. They don't want the ready-made 340-pounder who needs to lose 20 pounds, although a guy like Evan Neal is still going to be uh, highly coveted, and he was, what, 380, I think, as a sophomore. Um, they want the, the Tristan Lees, the athletic kids who can move around. So, you know, He'll go to Clemson. Now, Clemson doesn't do a great job of producing offensive linemen. That's one area. Defensive linemen, yes, but not offensive linemen. So that's kind of interesting, and that'll be the selling point for other schools against them, but they're still going to get them. All right. Uh, last one, last point here. Uh, five guys fighting back from injury that are going to impact uh, the next college football season. I like this one a lot. Number one, Dylan Moses. This one seems easy. I mean, I think Dylan Moses would have been a first-round pick this year, even without playing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, you're talking about Patrick Queen in the first round, um, who's a great athlete who came on at the end of last season and really impressed people. But Dylan Moses, I think, would be a guy that, you know, people would be tempted to take him in the first round this year if he came out. But now he's going to come back. He'll lead that defense. He'll dominate. He'll be a first rounder. He's obviously a kid we've covered since seventh grade, freak athlete. Has a lot to prove, but. Um, you know, he'll prove it. There's no doubt he's going to come back stronger than ever. Yeah, he, he's he's definitely – it was interesting because we kind of cooled on him late, and then luckily you you saved us by making him a five-star at the end because we, we weren't sure of his, his productivity. But, yeah, it might have just been a situation where we saw him so many times and didn't – Love too much. Right. Love exactly. him too much. Remember, he's a running back, then he was a linebacker, then he was – you know, really not very refined as a linebacker. His junior film wasn't great. <clears throat> Senior film was solid at IMG. Uh, the final ranking came down to Under Armour, <clears throat> and he was excellent as a linebacker, showed those instincts we were looking for. And he was a five-star. And to this day, his father still hates me. <laughs> you, But I'm saying it, you know, I gave you a lot of guff. But I think you were probably outvoted and pulled the feral executive order to keep him a yeah. Right. No, that one I did. I mean, he was he was a five who went to four who went to back back to five, and those are rare. Uh, but you know, sometimes they pan out. Um, you know, I'm trying to think of some others. You know, Raquan McMillan was one of those guys. Remember, uh, yeah. he panned out pretty good. You know, he's in the NFL right now. Um, the dude at Florida, the defensive end, Ugh. Fowler, Fowler, Dante Fowler. Fowler. Yeah. He was a four or five. I mean, he was a five, four or five guy as well. So, you know, Dylan Moses is the next in that line and he'll be a first rounder and he'll impact college football. If they had Dylan Moses last year, I think uh, things might've been a little bit different. All right. Next up Walker Little. Uh, this is the five-star offensive lineman for Stanford. Seemed to me like he maybe could have come back at the end of the year, but didn't. Uh, it was interesting following his saga and then he's another guy. I'm telling you, he could have gone into the draft and would have gotten picked uh, maybe first end of the first, early second round. He comes back to school. Uh, you think this is when he finally lives up? Because he was another one of these guys, high ceiling, needed work, needed a little work, but uh, he's played well when he's been able to stay on the field. 
Yeah, you know, they were so injury riddled last year, Stanford, and I think the Walker Little injury really was one of the things that started their downward slide. So they're not a four and eight football team talent wise or coaching wise. And I think they'll be back, you know, at least to respectable levels. And I think he'll return, you know, this year and, and be one of the best offensive tackles in the draft uh, for 2021. He's just a, a ridiculous talent. And, you know, no point rushing back when your team's so bad. Um, but Walker Little, you want to impact college football. I mean, Stanford is not going to win the Pac-12. They're not going to go to the playoff. But he's certainly going to impact his draft status by coming back. He's, he's a very, very good football player. All right, next up, speaking of uh, bad rankings, uh, Rondale Moore, our guy ranked <laughs> by uh, yours truly. Uh, <laughs> although we all saw him and – Guess what? I, I, you know, rewatched the video from Army. I'm sorry. We just never, I just never saw it. We had no idea he was going to be. Sometimes awesome. that happens. Right. But one of the reasons we had concern was his size and the fact that he might be injured a lot. He missed uh, all of, uh, almost all of last season. I think he played maybe four games. But he's another one that probably could have come back at the end and maybe played it safe. Uh, he could be huge because Purdue – for all the attention they get, they haven't quite taken that next step. So uh, talk about Rondell. Yeah, I think he's, you know, obviously this, the, the speed and elusiveness and the way they utilize him in the offense and the strength that he has, he's a really powerful kid. I mean, it's funny, we, we ranked him as a five, seven, three star, high three star. And, and people, you know, always crap on three stars. You know, three stars are vital to the, you know, importance of any program. I don't care if you're Alabama or, or Purdue or whoever. And they can become NFL football players without a doubt. We've seen it. And Hall of Famers. Uh, it was funny. After we ranked him, I think we started to see his workouts on, I don't know, Instagram or Twitter or something where he was like, yeah. you know, deadlifting 8,000 pounds and bench pressing 680 pounds or whatever. He's so freaking strong. And I think that's uh, really one of the things that's underappreciated about him. He's tough to bring down after the catch. So, you know, as he goes, Purdue goes, and it'll be fun to see him back in the Big Ten. Again, they're not going to win the Big Ten, but they're going to be a whole lot better, um, you know, especially with some of the, 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 you know, freshmen that they had impact last year and, and how, you know, they're recruiting a lot of skill talent. I think uh, Purdue's going to be fun to watch, and Rondell will be one of those guys who, you know, once again becomes one of the top 10 or 15 college football players in the country. Uh, and if I was better friends with Dave Lackford and trusted his opinion more like I do now, he would have been ranked higher because Dave was on me nonstop. But, you know, when you first meet Dave, he's, yeah. he's a little bit of a character and you don't know what you can trust. But Dave's also one of those guys that's going to take one ranking and, and live forever <laughs> on that. You know, like he's going to be 20 years from now when I'm in a nursing home, he's going to be talking about Rondell Moore and how everybody missed him. So. You know, sometimes those guys you just can't listen to because they're going to get one right. And then and then the next guy that they say, and I'm not going to name his name, but he's in this class, turns out to be not so good. Oh, boy, I want to hear who that is. Uh, real quick. You no, know who I'm talking about. I'm not going to name his name. but you know. Real quick, Rondell Moore story. At the Army Bowl that year, after everything was over, him and his family came up to talk to me and said, oh, did we do enough to move up in the rankings? And I told him, I said, you know, Rondale, you have no reason to care about what I think at all. Go to college, play really well, get rich, and make me look stupid. And uh, he's almost <laughs> he's almost done every single one of these. Definitely made me look stupid. He's about to get rich. So uh, well, I hope he holds a grudge. There's guys still out there that hold a grudge. Uh, you know, and it's always fun. You know, to see the the Brian Cushings of the world who you know are already out of football still being ticked off and you know the Jamal Adams of the world who are you know millionaire superstars who get ticked off because they were 30th in the country or whatever. Uh, did you see uh, did you see Chris Johnson take a shot at us? No. Oh uh, see yeah old Chris Johnson the running back uh, on Instagram uh, posted his ranking and said you know not even a picture no respect two star. No respect. Well he was, a, he was a two star nothing who went to East Carolina who Honestly, just was fast. He well, and he counts. So, you know, Chris he Johnson, might, C2K or whatever they call you, you, you proved us wrong. He might have had, he might have had some other options too, had some other things. Uh, well, yeah, he had some on field issues. 
So we don't get into those. Uh, next up, Josh Kando, who I completely forgot about until I was doing <laughs> some draft prep. And I was like, oh, yeah, whatever happened to him? Uh, is he coming out in the draft? And then I had to realize, no, he's not even close to coming out in the draft. No, not even close. And he wouldn't have been eligible anyways and got hurt. So, you know, he's a guy that's going to really help Florida State, though. You know, they need some, some leaders. They need some guys. Uh, you know, we got Marvin Wilson on the inside. They got Kano coming back healthy. Uh, their defense needs to improve quite a bit. And we both know – you know, what a hard worker Marvin Wilson is. We both know what a, what a hard worker Josh Kando is and, and how athletic and explosive these guys can be. So that's a great one-two punch there. And I think they really missed him last year. It wouldn't have mattered because their offense was so horrible and he can't throw the ball or block. So it's not going to help in that respect. But having him off the edge, it's going to help Florida State's defense. So it's weird to see guys like Kando and, and reminding me of uh, like the guy from Notre Dame that, that's coming out of the draft, uh, the edge guy, I can't remember his name. Him and his brother both went there. Um, and like Nick Coe from Auburn. Yeah, yeah. You know, Kando, in my mind, was way ahead of those guys in high school. So the talent has got to probably still be there. We just got to unlock it. You know, he was – his junior year, he was sort of a skinny outside pass rusher guy. Right, that's the guy. Exactly. His senior year, he started to work a little bit more inside, be better against the run, and, and, and got – but he was still skinny. You know, so he was sort of one of those guys we projected that would get 265 pounds and be great. Still hasn't reached there yet. I think the other guys, you know, especially Co, were more physically dominant but didn't have the same array of pass rushing moves or the same athleticism as Kane does. So, you know, we'll see. I, I don't think he's a first-rounder, you know, but he's still got time to – to get to that level or, or, or get into that discussion. Uh, but it's, it, they're just going to be happy to have him back on the field. Did we rank him as a five-star? I can't remember now. Uh, he was a high five-star. He's like number eight in the country. Ouch. Uh, okay. Hold well, on. we'll see. We'll see. It's still not over. We'll blame other people for that one anyway. Uh, last but not least, JT Daniels. You mentioned Keaton Slovis, and he had a huge year at quarterback, but Daniels didn't transfer. So somebody told him something that there's going to be a competition, at least for this job. Do you think he can win it, or do you think he, he ends up – one of them is going to end up leaving, I have to imagine. Uh, but do you think he can win the job? No, I, I think he can. You know, Slovis put up great numbers last year, and he was very good for, for a freshman. I mean, really played above and beyond, uh, you know, as a three-star kid and, you know, didn't get a ton of attention, whereas JT Daniels was a five-star accelerated his, his uh, graduation. You remember, he's still very, very young. Um, and he stayed. And there's a reason he stayed. And that's to come back and prove that he's the quarterback at USC. So we'll see how he bounces back from injury. But that's going to be good for both of them, at least for a year. They're going to push each other. And then the winner will stay. And then the loser will move on to the transfer portal. But I really don't want people to forget about JT Daniels and just say, oh, well, he's done. This kid has so much talent and throws one of the best deep balls you're going to see. Obviously, teammates in high school with Amon Ross St. Brown, uh, they have a tremendous connection there as well. So I, I just don't think that USC quarterback situation is anything but, but open. Okay, so here's, here's what I want to ask you about. For years, the air raid offense put up these huge numbers at Texas Tech or Washington State. And for the most part, the quarterbacks, we were like, oh, those numbers are garbage. You know, whoever, you know, Hawaii, Colt Brennan or whoever. We didn't really take them seriously until Graham Harrell. Graham Harrell, yeah. Until Mahomes became like amazing. And we said, oh, we, when we blew off Mahomes because he put up these giant numbers in the offense or even uh, Gardner Minshew. Right. So every one of the quarterbacks that's ever played in this offense uh, at the big schools under the gurus, uh, either Mike Leach uh, or Cliff Kingsbury, whoever, has put up huge numbers. So Slovis steps in and puts up huge numbers, and he had probably three or four at least NFL wide receivers. Do you think if Daniels was, in a, was healthy in the offense, he would have put up comparable numbers? Mm-hmm. Yeah, comparable or maybe even better, <clears throat> you know, and, and again, the weapons are there. That's why I, every time I, I keep thinking about USC, I'm like, 
you know, everybody's writing them off and they're going to suck and Clay Helton's going to be fired. But there's so much talent on that football team that they have a chance to be really good. And I'm talking like 10 and two really good. And, and I'm talking Pac-12 champion really good. So, you know, I think JT would have put up the same numbers. Um, you know, they're different quarterbacks. They do things, you know, as far as their specialties, a little bit different. Uh, but they're also extremely accurate quarterbacks and they've got dynamic wide receivers. So, you know, whoever wins the job is going to put up big numbers. Um, and I think JT would have done that. Now, I'm not saying JT is going to win the job, but people have forgotten about him. You right. cannot forget about him. Do not. Slovis get hurt. You know, let's say Slovis wins the job, gets hurt. JT Daniels is probably the best backup quarterback in college football. Yeah, one thing about uh, Slovis, uh, you know, I watch a lot of the Pac-12, as you know, he can kind of, when he's on, he's on, but when he's off, he can make a few bad mistakes. Obviously, he was a true freshman, but I think that's something to monitor, too, because, you know, he had some of that, almost like uh, Justin Herbert had uh, for Oregon, where all of a sudden he gets in a rut, and the next thing you know, he's throwing two or three picks or whatever. So yep. uh, put that under your cap. So that is the video three-point stance. First ever. Yeah, boy, we're going to have to, we're probably turning this into a podcast, too, uh, Mike, and release it on your feed. Uh, maybe cut up some of the videos individually. So uh, thanks so much. Sorry we went past the time limit. Blame me. It's my fault. What was the time limit? Well, I thought you had to be off uh, 15. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm late, definitely. But uh, I, I didn't think we were going to go 20, 20 minutes on this. So uh, if anybody's still sticking in to the end of this, thank you very much. And we love you. And thank you. All right. To, uh, read Mike's written three-point stance on Thursday, right? Thursday. And uh, ch check us out because we've got a ton of these videos coming. And uh, subscribe to Mike's podcast, Godfather and Gorney, and my podcast, Commitment Issues. I think we'll run this on both, Mike. This was a good conversation. Sure. Let's do that. All right. Thanks a lot. See ya.